Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Enid Slack, and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs here at the University of Toronto. On behalf of Alan Broadbent, the chair of our board, and the rest of the board and staff at IMFG, I'm delighted to welcome you here today to our session on defining the realm of the possible challenges and opportunities for Toronto with our guest speaker, Peter Wallace, the city manager for Toronto. And for those of you who may have thought about going to the Blue Jays game, <laughs> the score is? 2-1 uh, Texas. Texas. We will keep you updated. <laughs> you will not regret coming here today. Today's session is the fourth annual IMFG event with the Toronto City Manager, but it's the first with Peter Wallace. The idea behind this annual event is to get an update on how the city is doing financially, the current challenges it faces, and the opportunities that lie ahead. We're delighted that Peter has agreed to continue the tradition that we started with Joe Penichetti. And Joe is here, by the way. Our major focus at IMFG over the last 10 years has been on the fiscal health of cities, Toronto, but also other cities in Canada and around the world. Fiscal health is about balancing the budget every year, which of course all Canadian municipalities have to do. But it is much more than that. It's also about having the ability to invest in the future. Toronto, like other Canadian cities, relies largely on property taxes and user fees and provincial grants to make expenditures. Under the City of Toronto Act, it has access to some other taxes and has taken advantage of things like the land transfer tax and the billboard tax. As we look around the world, however, we see that other major cities have access to a broader mix of taxes. And the question we always ask here is, can Toronto remain fiscally healthy without uh, the ability to levy other taxes. So this afternoon, Peter will shed some light on the finances of the city, but he'll also talk about the opportunities and challenges the city faces in achieving social, economic, city building, environment, environmental, and governance objectives. Before I introduce our moderator for this afternoon, I would like to thank the sponsors of the Institute, Havana Capital, the province of Ontario, TD Bank Group, and the City of Toronto. I'd also like to thank our team at IMFG uh, because they're the ones who make these events happen. Uh, Selena Zhang, our Manager of Programs and Research. Uh, Dina Grazer, who's now a Senior Advisor with us. Uh, Carolyn Carteropel, who's our new Administrative Assistant. And Abigail Friendly, who's our Postdoctoral Fellow. And a couple of uh, little announcements again. Um, I'd like to ask that nobody use uh, flash photography because we are webcasting the event today. Also, if you're inclined to tweet about the event, our hashtag is IMFG Talks. I don't know what any of that means, but I was told to say it. <laughs> so we are lucky to have our moderator for today, who is Merrick Gertler. I know that Merrick needs no introduction, particularly in a venue like this, so I will keep it brief. Merrick is the 16th president of the University of Toronto. His biography says that he is one of the world's foremost urban theorists and policy practitioners, and he really is. I travel around the world to talk about municipal finance and governance. Most recently, I was in Scotland, and everybody knows Merrick. They know his work. They praise his work, and particularly his work on innovation and the economic dynamism of cities. Merrick spoke last year as part of our Big Cities, Big Ideas series about the critical role of the university in making the city work and the equally crucial role of the city in making the university work. This topic is something that Merrick obviously feels very passionately about. So who could be a better moderator for a session on Toronto's challenges and opportunities than Merrick Girdler? I'm delighted to welcome you back to IMFG. Thanks so much, Enid. Well, what a wonderful gathering this is of uh, urbanists of every stripe. We have top scholars, we've got policy folks. Uh, really, this is a kind of A-list gathering of city builders. I think that's the best way to describe the, the group that we have here this afternoon. As uh, Enid has already uh, said, one of my top priorities since becoming president has been to uh, find ways 
for the university to work more closely uh, with partners in the city region uh, for the mutual benefit of both parties. Um, and uh, as one step in that direction, uh, this past June, I announced the appointment of two new presidential advisors on urban engagement, Shauna Braille and John Broadhead, both of whom are here. I see Shauna there and John there. Um, the goal here was really to make the boundary around the university, this kind of imaginary boundary, more porous, easier to transcend um, as a way of fostering collaboration and partnership. With that in mind, I just wanted to give a shout out to IMFG, which in my view has championed this cause since its inception. You were ahead of the curve. Uh, through the, the program of research and outreach and public engagement that IMFG has made possible. So let me salute uh, the Institute and particularly Enid Slack uh, and her colleagues for your tremendous work. Um, as Enid has already said um, so eloquently, the relationship between the university and the city uh, is critically important and that's city with a lowercase c and city with an uppercase C. And today we happen to be uh, dealing with uh, the uppercase C quite explicitly. Uh, I think everyone in this room appreciates how there is huge potential for both parties to gain from closer cooperation. Uh, and so that's why I'm so delighted indeed to be uh, moderating today's event and why I'm so delighted to be welcoming back uh, Peter Wallace, welcoming him back to U of T. Peter brings unique experience and insight uh, to uh, these matters of huge importance that we're going to be discussing today and the role that he occupies now at City Hall. And I'm sure his remarks uh, will stimulate a lot of lively conversation. Uh, with over 30 years of experience in the public service, Peter Wallace has become a city manager of the City of Toronto as of July 2015. He is responsible directly for some 30,000 staff, although the broader empire, uh, empire over which he presides, uh, as you will see in his slides, is closer to 55,000, about an $11 billion operating budget and a $32 billion 10-year capital plan. So this is no small operation. Um, Peter's very distinguished career in public service began in 1981, and he's held the most senior positions in the government of Ontario having served as Secretary of the Cabinet, Head of the Ontario Public Service, and Clerk of the Executive Council. He has also served as Deputy Minister of Finance and Secretary of the Treasury Board, Deputy Minister of Energy, and Deputy Minister and Associate Secretary of the Cabinet. Peter also happens to be a double graduate of the University of Toronto, having earned a BA with honors in political economy and a master's degree in public administration. We were delighted to welcome Peter back to campus last year as the Ontario Public Service Visiting Fellow in our School of Public Policy and Governance. So there are many senses in which we are welcoming Peter Wallace back to the University of Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Wallace. All of these expectations build up, and then I actually show up. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, President Gertler and Professor uh, Slack. Uh, I do appreciate this uh, opportunity. I look forward not only to a chance to, to lead us through a series of slides, but, but really to the interaction and uh, dialogue that follows. I want to make one thing completely uh, explicit. This overlaps in time with the Blue Jays' uh, playoff game. I will be completely unoffended and, in fact, actually expect that people are on their devices as I chatter uh, away. So if I see little blue screens, that, unlike for those of our professors who are very offended by that when that happens in your class, I think that's a perfectly fine uh, idea. So go ahead and, uh, and uh, keep track. And if anything important happens, feel free to shout it out. Um, uh, as I wander through my, uh, my material and as uh, uh, we wander through the, the Q&A and, and subsequent uh, pieces. 
Um, I do want to start off with an acknowledgement of uh, Joe, because Joe has uh, obviously done the previous uh, iterations of this lecture. And I am really very much picking up where Joe has left off. And I'm picking up where Joe has left off in two important perspectives. I'm picking up from him and learning from his city building objectives. And I also am picking up and working through some of the concerns he's raised in prior lectures about the fiscal structure and long-term sustainability of the ability of the City of Toronto to fund its core city building objectives. So, Joe, this is really very consistent, I believe, with your core message and core uh, approach. So, let me talk a little bit about what I'm going to, uh, to say. And, and the primary focus of my remarks will really be and I'll show a little bit later about how Joe has raised the issue of, of structural deficits. And, and we know that, that Enid and uh, Andre Cote in their earlier review of, of uh, Toronto's fiscal perspective talked about Toronto as an aging maple leaf defenseman <laughs> with bad knees. Um, that was, in fact, the actual reference. You can, uh, you can look it up. So, you know, I am the new city manager. And I believe profoundly in public policy and city building, and I'll talk about that. But I also believe profoundly that what we, what we do is what we fund. So there's rhetoric, but there's also what we do. And what we do is extremely correlated with what we actually fund. That is the primary mechanism by which public policy has an impact is through the expenditure and through that, that lever. And it's a great idea to have great city building ideas and capacity, but really we have to ask ourselves, are we on track to be able to fund, to make those not just rhetorical, but actually into uh, reality? And you know, Joe has raised the question of structural deficit and fiscal sustainability, and Enid and Andre have raised the issues of whether or not the knees are too sore to continue and whether or not there's expensive uh, surgery. So I want to take a look at that, and I'm going to take a look at that highly informally because, to be very direct, I do not yet have the information, the knowledge, or the capacity to really provide good, solid advice on this yet. So what I'm going to do is address this at the level of thought experiment, and that's not a dodge. That's kind of under reasonable assumptions, what do we think happens to the fiscal structure of the City of Toronto, and where does that take us? So there will be subsequent advice. I will lead the conversation with our staff. We will lead and create a long-term report to Council. Council's asked for it. There will be a specific debate, and there will be good, solid advice to Council. This is not yet that. This is not that opportunity. This is the opportunity to take advantage of what I believe to be a relatively comfortable, relatively engaged forum of fellow fiscal nerds. <laughs> That's my hope and my perspective here. Have a dialogue with you, not at the level of detailed facts, but at the level of we care about our city. Have we set in motion the appropriate framework to accomplish what we would collectively like to accomplish and what I believe Council will, in its wisdom, ask us to accomplish. So that's where we are. This is not preempting our dialogue with Council. This is not preempting our advice. This is not saying from the city manager something specific. This is working our way through the basic core issues that I think Joe and Enid have in their respective ways put on the table about our longer term uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal capacity. And I intend to take advantage of this forum to further that dialogue and advantage of the questions and answers to try and figure out what other perspectives there are from civil society on what I think is a really important uh, question. So some of my slides are pretty complicated and obvious. Some of them are very obvious. This one tells us what we already know. And what we already know from the research done at U of T by President Gertler and so many others is that municipalities and regions really, really matter. We drive the economic and competitiveness environment, we have a huge impact on the quality of life of our residents. And from the perspective of the 416 and a little bit broader geographic region, we know that the types of decisions made and implemented in City Hall, made, funded, and implemented in City Hall, will be determinative of our collective success in managing the pressures of population growth and development helping us integrate no newcomers into our society, and helping us address what we can feel in our bones is the increased income stratification of our society. And these are things that, that governments in Canada 
all over the world are addressing, but we know that these are issues that matter in our society. These are matters that, that, that we, as local government, have something to say about. So what we do, what the city does, really does matter, and I take that as an important uh, starting point. So the conversation, while the setting is academic, the conversation around how we do this is far from academic. It's a real and important conversation. There's one other thing I want to take a step just before I get into this slide. I want to take a step back, and I want to speak to a reality of public services, which I think is important. We tend to think of public services, and this is an ultimate nerd point, and to some extent I sort of apologize for this, but we tend to think of public services as static. We tend to think of your garbage is picked up, the wastewater runs away, it's all the same. But that is not true. So think about the runoff that comes out of the sky, hits a street, goes into a drain. 20 or 30 years ago, that went into a combined sewer system. If there was an overflow, it immediately contaminated the lake. 20 or 30 years ago, we had a paramedic service, picked you up, did some good stuff. Those services are now way more complex than they were a relatively short time ago. The dispatch, the level of care associated with a paramedic service vastly exceeds what we could have gotten a few years ago. If we wanted to provide 1980s or even 1990s level of service, we could do that for a fraction of the current cost. Similarly, if we wanted to treat our wastewater as we used to treat it, we could do it for a fraction of the cost. What our city building has bought us is hugely beneficial water treatment for wastewater. Huge tanks at the waterfront that make a really big difference in the quality of environmental life, the quality of life our residents experience in that context. That is not free, and also it's not optional. It's required by the province of Ontario. So let's remember that services are an evolving context. While the citizen may experience them as, if I phone 1911, I get picked up, or my wastewater flows into a ditch and disappears, the externalities associated with those uh, public services have been managed in an incredibly different way. We don't see that from a value for money perspective, but that hugely drives the value proposition of, of public services. As I said, an ultimately nerdy point, but what I wanted to think about as we think about the role and centrality of public services and the fact that public services, even at a municipal level, even at that granular coal face, we're picking up garbage, the quality of what we do is hugely different over time. I think it's a tremendous investment. But it is not an investment that takes place without some real pressure. And, and this is a dilemma that applies to my old world as much as it applies to my, real, my current uh, world. They're both very real. Um, just the, there, There's a standard dilemma here you face as a public policy analyst. And, and the standard dilemma is, let's give us more for less. What we want, what we desperately want, is more public services. We want more transit. We want more environmental quality. We want better fire protection. We want more public safety. We want all of these other really critical things. At the same time, we're really uncomfortable asking the public to pay more for uh, those. And from a public per service perspective, it's kind of it's frustrating. You want to throw up your hands and say, political actors, make up your mind. Which one do you want? I'm not here to answer that question, but I am here to say that there is legitimacy in both perspectives. There is a reality in increased public demand for public transit, for better health and social outcomes, for all of those other things that can be uniquely delivered, the risks socialized, the externalities internalized through a public sector mechanism. That matters enormously. At the same time, we have to recognize that for a huge number of our residents, and especially those residents who are caught paying property tax, because property tax is not a progressive income source, that their incomes are very often stagnant. Their wealth is not increasing, and they feel taxes as a legitimate burden on their family finances. And let's also not forget that red tape, and there is some of it in the city, really does suck. It really does from time to time injure economic opportunity. So we have to recognize that this kind of conversation around public services are a great thing, but the cost of public services is a real issue. We need to find that balance. And as we you know, conduct our thought experiment, we have to recognize that there are legitimate pressures on both, uh, both uh, sides of that uh, equation. And we have to think increasingly 
as we care about things like income stratification, about not only the application of our money, but where it comes from, who we're taxing, who we're asking to, uh, to pay. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the province and the government of Canada approach that uh, dilemma. And this is, is a slide I draw from RBC Economics. It's public data published um, uh, last uh, month. And the pattern is really familiar. But basically what this is is the size of governments relative to the size of, of uh, GDP. And red bar being uh, Ontario, blue bar being uh, Canada. You can see this rise over the kind of recession uh, period very, very steeply. And you can see it begin to decline over that, that time. And, and this really is a function of the models that the government of Canada and the government of Ontario have used, which are to borrow, to not cut back expense during recession, and in fact, to increase expense, to allow revenue to decline, to not raise taxes during that uh, period, or really any period, and then to usher in very substantial levels of constraint over the, uh, the uh, recovery uh, period. And what that means is in practical terms, and I know I'm not supposed to walk away from the mic, but I'm going to. <laughs> These numbers here are dropping. So the percent of GDP occupied by the government of Ontario and the government of Ontario, uh, government of Canada, is dropping by roughly three-ish percent between the peak of the recession and the ultimate uh, balance year. And that's largely being achieved by constraint. So I think there are a couple of important lessons from a city perspective. That's not a model. We can't borrow to that uh, extent. Our front-facing services, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, much, much harder to constrain in a practical uh, uh, sense. And also, we have to recognize that these are real numbers. The reason that governments you know, the reason that governments feel that they are challenged is because they are challenged under their fiscal models. They are shrinking. And to the extent that we expect senior governments to pay more of our existing expense, that is a completely legitimate ask, one we need to continue to drive. But we also have to be realistic about the financial model, the structural model of the senior governments in that, in that context. So I just use that as a starting point, as an entry point into uh, the dialogue which then moves us on to the city of uh, Toronto. And, and there is an annual cycle. Uh, Joe, you did describe this to me. I don't think you actually described it to me enough. <laughs> I'm actually feeling that you owe me something as, as I, you know, he did say that, but maybe not in quite enough detail about how it actually uh, works. But basically, the cycle always works from the perspective of there's a shortfall. There's a shortfall inevitably and necessarily to maintain the current level of services in the coming fiscal uh, year. And that's always estimated in 2015. It was estimated that that 2016 gap would be roughly about you know 3.1% of, of operating the numbers vary for years. But it always starts off with a bracket or a red or a negative in front of uh, the number. That leads to a lengthy and agonizing process of pressure minimization, deferral, how we actually work it through. There's a complicated set of puts and takes on the revenue. You ultimately lead to a staff uh, recommended budget. Council reviews and ultimately approves uh, that budget, both operating and uh, capital. There's an in-year management process. And then fortunately, at the end, there tends to be a moderate, uh, moderate uh, surplus. This is often treated as an annual dance, and it's often felt that just because it's worked out in the last few years, it's always going to work out in the next uh, few years. That's one of the things I kind of want to test and have a, have a dialogue. One important observation here is that that city, that, that, that we know this from the core services review. We know that, that the city does very little of what the city does is fundamentally optional. Almost all of it is regulated, required by other levels of government, front-facing, quite granular, and if you take it away, it is easily missed. So we know that the city operates in a relatively narrow fiscal context. We know that public services at the provincial level are at the uh, provincial level are more removed, at the federal level far more removed, at the municipal level right in your face immediately uh, there. 
The final thing I want to say is that that surplus which is retained for capital is not an accident. That represents careful management. It's not manipulation. It's not something that the public service is creating to pull over the world to, uh, wool of, of uh, council. It is what happens when you last, uh, ask a large organization, $11 billion, to manage to an appropriate degree of, of uh, caution. Because going over is a very, very serious uh, challenge. You put yourself and your council in the hole for the next year. You really don't want to do that. That is really a bad outcome. So you manage appropriately. You end up with a moderate surplus. That goes to, uh, that goes to uh, fund reserves in the future. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, I'm going to go now to, to a slide that Joe showed uh, last year at this uh, time. And I did phone Joe up and tell him he was going to be a foil for me. Uh, he agreed. He did. He didn't, I didn't, wasn't super explicit about how he was going to be a foil, but <laughs> he did agree. Um, and basically, this is kind of the root. New city manager, what do you make of this? Like, like structural is a pretty powerful world. Structural word. Structural means it doesn't go away. Structural means that status quo, you know, it gets the same or or uh, likely uh, likely worse. We combine that with a sore knees issue. I think we have a, a question here about how this actually works. And there's something else. Joe said that is also really important, and, and he said it in many different ways, many different times, which is that even though we've achieved balance each year, it's getting harder on a year-by-year -year basis. That we're running out of the toolkit. I'm going to make another reference to that a little bit later, but just from a disclosure perspective, you know that is the basic element: is we have these quite material pressures, we have a toolkit. The pressures have been getting rigor bigger and more rigorous, and the toolkit has, uh, I think. Uh, been implied, uh, been uh, diminishing over a period of time, and the deficit is is structured as as is characterized as structural. So that's the background. That's the basic piece, and that leads me into my my thought experiment. And my thought experiment is is a very crude kind of mini Drummond uh, perspective where we basically take a step back and say, what's been happening to our revenue mix? What's been happening to our expense mix? If we just briefly make reasonable assumptions, what do we think happens to those over time? And where does that lead us from the level of intuition? What does that lead? And does that give us a comfort that we're on track for a city building agenda? Or is there an area of, of uh, concern there? So I want to reemphasize, be as clear as I possibly can, that this is a thought experiment. It's at the level of intuition. I'll show some quantitative slides, none of which are on a forecast basis. This is not designed to preempt the dialogue at council, not designed to take it away, not designed to preempt the long-term plan, just to give us a little bit of a sense of the types of pressures and answer a little bit the questions that I think Joe and Eden have put on, uh, on the table and I think are, are critically important. So the first slide, heinously complex, of only of interest to the most nerdy of, of us around uh, those things. Does anybody have an update on the Blue Jays? No? Okay, great. I apologize. 2-1 um, top, on top of the fifth. Thank you, John. That's, that's, that's absolutely, that's great. So, um, and I, it, trust me, if I was that clever, I'd put it in. And, and if I was that clever, I'd be making more money. <laughs> um, so, so here's the, just of interest here, that, that, that $4,000 per capita. When I talk about the fiscal footprint, a lot of that's transfers, but that, that does, uh, that's a pretty big thing. Like, like that's, a big, uh, that's a big government. That, that costs our families some, uh, some uh, money. The growth in that over time has actually been very modest. The province's per capita expenses over a similar period are up by maybe 50%. The feds, maybe 20%. The, uh, sorry, the, the Fed's up by a, a fair chunk, the province only up by 20, but the city only up by 20%. It is actually a relatively modest uh, growth in terms of, of expense and real per capita fully adjusted as a share of GDP. It's up only very modestly despite the fact that the services themselves are, are more complex. But I don't want to spend time on that. I want to spend some time on where the revenue comes from. And this is, is an interesting slide to me because of, of really the stability. And what we see is that other revenues, property taxes, user fees, they're growing modestly over time with the economy. But there are two slices that starting from the mid-2000s 
have in fact started to increase very, very rapidly. And they are the utility fees and municipal land transfer tax. And I want to spend a second on those because in the mid-2000s, there was a perspective that the city was running into some fiscal issues associated with the ability to fund longer-term investments in water, wastewater, and solid waste. And there was a decision made to put in place user fees associated with those to create reserves and then to draw those reserves over time. And that is how we get the very significant increase in the dark blue bar. That is the way municipalities work. They do not have the powerful amortization tools available to the governments of Canada and Ontario. They do what households do when they can't borrow an enormous amount of money. They pre-fund, i.e. they save, and then they make the expense. So that is my view, an example of something going right, where we understand a fiscal pressure, begin to put in place investment, begin to build the reserves, and we have created, I think, excellent, excellent services. We're in a position to fund them over a sustainable period of time. The other is the municipal land transfer tax, which has grown very, very steeply from nothing a number of years ago to the better part of $500 million. Whether or not that forecast was, that was forecastable, other things, we can have a debate. But what I'd like you to do from a thought experiment is just imagine the state of the city of finances if previous councils had not done that. What would the finances look like had there not been the requirement to build reserves for water and solid waste? And had there not been a revenue tool, $500 million would be a very diminished City of Toronto budget. It would not look like what it looks like now. It would have been a very difficult environment. So really, when we talk about revenue tools, it's not an abstract thing. Those revenue tools are what has allowed the City of Toronto to make the investments it has made to, the, uh, to this date and allowed that annual cycle to continue without vicious contractionary restraint or huge challenges. It actually has worked out very, very well. So there is some magic in the revenue base and understanding the reality uh, of, of uh, that. It also turns out from a practical and nerdy standpoint that the income, the elasticity associated with um, the uh, utility fees is pretty low. So, so once they're in place, they tend to perform very, very well. And while people consume less water and will make choices to uh, alter their garbage habits to avoid some of the, the fees, that's both a good thing in and of itself and something that actually hasn't altered the fiscal model uh, very much. So the real point here is that, that far from not having fiscal tools, the province has, the city has used its fiscal tools, used them creatively and well, and that has underlined some of the stability we've had over the past uh, while. But at the level of intuition now, are we actually understanding, and I'll talk about the expense in a little while, but where do we think revenue goes uh, forward from here? Basically, and, and these are selected, we could chose other revenue elements on here, but basically, what do we think what do you think about where they're likely to go? Property tax feels to me that it doesn't rise naturally. It has to be reset on an annual basis. And there's generally a policy objective to hold that, very consistent policy objective across municipalities over a period of time to hold that consistent with inflation. And that reflects the concerns we have about the ability of taxpayers to pay quite a challenging tax. Then we have user fees. We've put them in place, but those user fees are already at high levels, already adequately fund. It's not clear that we have other elements uh, in the reserve. Provincial federal transfers, absolutely, and we're all hoping for additional incremental revenue from uh, the province and from the government of Canada. We know that they are constrained. We know that they will fund some incremental investment. They are committed to that. That's a very, very good thing. There's a question about whether or not they'll fund some of the existing gaps or existing holes we have. And then land transfer tax, we've done very well. It's gone from zero to 500. It's a question of how well it will continue to uh, perform. And it does have the potential for some volatility. The thing about volatility is it can go two ways. You know, it, high prices are great, but, but they can go a couple of different ways and particularly just the, the volume associated with that. So, you know, my own sense, if we can flip the side, is that that revenue growth 
is going to parallel nominal GDP at best. That, that it doesn't, there isn't a natural kind of growing. And that's different than the governments of Canada and Ontario, where by taxing at the higher income stream and stuff like that, you tend to get some benefits. You know, from here it looks to me like revenue growth is at or consistent with the rate of, of economic growth, but no windfall. So if we have a gap, not easy to close on the revenue side under the status quo. Let's look at the expense side. Again, a heinously uh, compact slide. Anybody asks me questions about this, I'll pop it up later in the Q&A and take you through it in great detail. I'm going to flip to the next piece and basically show here's what underlies it. And fundamentally, there are real cost pressures. And these cost pressures were not constrained over the term of the Lost Council. These pressures were not fundamentally addressed over that period. And we can see that cost share, basically the welfare side. Basically, for those of you who think about the nomenclature of the city of Toronto, that's your cluster A side. It has actually been getting, as a share, it's actually been getting a little bit smaller. What's been driving up has been TTC and police. Those are areas where we're buying labor, we're buying expensive labor, we're buying expensive labor that's negotiated under specific contract positions, contract uh, provisions. So, you know, that is a reality. So if I look at that, am I thinking that, that at the level of intuition, we have mastered the fiscal picture on the operating side? Maybe not. You know, some of those pressures are going to continue to be there. The possibility of them outstripping the rate of revenue growth is, I think, real, something we need to think about and be prepared to have a dialogue uh, about. Next slide. And, and on the operating side, I'm a little uncertain about that. Where I feel a little bit more confident, frankly, is on the capital side, where, and, and the president was kind enough to mention the, the empire and the over $30 billion kind of capital uh, piece, which is impressive and critical and will make a huge difference in the quality of public services in the city. But it is also, it, they have this construct in the city, it, it's consistent with that of the province, of below the line. And below the line is oftentimes thought of as nice to have. But it's not just nice to have. The below the line, the not yet funded, not yet in the envelope piece, includes things like, you know, a whole bunch of TTC, state of good repair. We're not going to not do that. It includes a whole lot of things like the Gardner East Deck, which, you know, is quite likely to be a council uh, priority. It includes things that are vitally important, but we will have to do, including meeting the regulatory requirements by the province of Ontario to rebuild our long-term care facilities, which is something we're quite likely to want to do anyway. So I'm trying not to get ahead of council here, but I am saying that that $32 billion actually likely understates the reality of what we would likely want to do for our city. So I flip the slide, and here's what I basically think is happening here. I'm thinking that overall, net to net, you know, thought experiment, you know, operating is going to push, going to be a little bit higher than uh, nominal GDP growth, in turn a little bit higher than revenue, and our major capital needs not yet fully funded. So Joe, you're right. You know, there is a structural gap here. It's not just an annual basis, it doesn't go away, and it doesn't go away easily. Now we can address it through all sorts of tools, that's a different conversation, but the first thing I want to actually talk about is, you know, is that real? Not advice to counsel yet, early perspective, try not to be naive here, but early perspective, it looks like something we want to be a little bit thoughtful about and a little bit concerned about. And, and you know, I think the next slide is, is an important one because is it something that, that we can make go away? You know, is it something that, that, that we can, as we have done in the past, kind of work our way through the annual cycle? And, and you know, I think we do have to look at that. I think we do have to kind of explore a couple of things. And, and the, the debt service limit is a self-imposed 15% um, of property tax uh, revenue. It can be expanded, but even a modest expansion of that will make some dent, but not an overwhelming dent in the capital uh, service uh, requirements. We, we've already 
depleted and are in the process of further depleting the housing reserves, and we know that housing is one of the major sources of, of pressure on both operating and uh, capital. There has been some transformational investment, and the city has done marvelously in a post-amalgamation environment in terms of creating shared services and driving those things. But much of the more fundamental transformational investment that will allow you to take out costs has not been uh, made. Um, we are seeing some annualized costs. Those are what I referred to earlier around the TTC, uh, police, fire, public safety uh, drivers. And we are seeing that council does want us to continue to deliver on core service uh, priorities and is not telling us to diminish the level of services. So that kind of toolkit that we might have brought at basically can we make these things work on an annual basis, it doesn't feel as rich as it might to be, might have been, and that's entirely consistent with the narrative and findings of, uh, of Enid and her uh, group, and entirely consistent with the public dialogue that Joe conducted over a period of time at this table, and also with, uh, with council. So I think then we, we kind of flip here, and, and really, what do we want to do about this? And, and uh, I do think we want to talk about the multi-year perspective. And, and we do need to focus in, in my day job, on the 2016 basis and how that works. But ultimately, this is a multi-year challenge. And, and I think there is a question it needs to be, I'm putting on the table, we may be at or close to an inflection point about whether or not the city can continue with its current structure. I think we need to have the conversation around structure. By, stru by structure, I mean the state of the finances. We need to have that, uh, that uh, dialogue. We need to respectfully consider what we might do about that. But I don't think we approach this from the perspective of the fiscal tools quite yet. I think we approach it from a different perspective, which is from the perspective of what would council want us to do? What are council's priorities? What investments would the mayor and council like us to make in a prosperous, growing city? What are the core public service requirements we have? How can we make those as efficient and as least costly as possible? But once we understand that, is there a gap? And if there is a gap, how do we go about filling it? This is not an existential life or death problem. This is a routine public finance problem where the experience of the last few years has tended to not pay adequate attention to the known need to build reserves and some capacity to fund known pressures. We have undersold, my best guess, the reality of the need for public services. The long-term cost containment strategies were not long-term cost containment strategies. The pressures continue to grow. They're hard to push back on. We don't want arbitrary cuts. We want to get this right. How do we actually bring those pieces together? I think ultimately that is a dialogue for council, but I think it's a dialogue that council needs to have and needs to think about. And we do know that in the past, when the city has come up to these challenges, the city has performed beautifully. It has created the reserves, it's created the capacity, it's created the investment, and it's done very well. So I don't view this as, as, uh, as anything other than another challenging but vitally important uh, dialogue. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to ask for any updates on the Blue Jays game. Stu still 2-1, still and now I'm going to move over to that table and make myself available to Merrick and his dialogue, and then ultimately you guys can have a run at me. Thank you so much. And I'm going to say I'm on time. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, that was a terrific overview. You covered a lot of ground there, and I'm sure um, there will be an appetite for some questions from the floor, but perhaps before we get to that, um, I'll uh, let the audience uh, have a few minutes to think up some really good questions and ask you a few less good questions, but uh, we'll get, get started nevertheless. Um, so let me begin by pressing a little bit on some of the assumptions underlying your um, absolutely your 
your characterization of the current state of play, and particularly around the revenue side. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, let's talk about revenue tools. Um, other cities around the world do indeed levy a, a pretty broad range of taxes, uh, and notwithstanding the point you made about uh, the uh, land transfer tax and uh, the um, uh, you know user fees that have been introduced recently, I think you know folks in this room would probably uh, argue that there's capacity for the city to do more in this regard. And I just wondered what you thought of of uh, that strategy. Um, you know, does Toronto need to consider levying other kinds of taxes? And if so, uh, what approach would one imagine using in order to make the case for those new taxes? So, I think that is exactly the right. Sorry, <laughs> I think that's. I think that is exactly the uh, a critical question, and I want to be slightly cautious here, because as I think I said, um, I, I don't want this. From my perspective, this debate doesn't start with revenue tools. This debate starts with what are our objectives. And if we want lean, mean, U.S.-style services, then, frankly, we're pretty good, and we may have excess revenue. We may actually be in a position where we, we collect too much. So I think there's a core policy choice, and that's not a policy choice that, that public servants makes. That's a, that's a policy choice that, that council makes. I think I understand uh, the, from this council and this mayor that they do in fact believe pretty profoundly in the efficacy of, of public action. They do believe pretty profoundly that, that the work we do uh, matters. And it's not just about picking up the garbage or picking up the garbage in the same way it's always been picked up, that it is really about core investments in, in city building and that, that includes a new and, and uh, more dynamic uh, municipal uh, community, and that does require that does require a level of investment. I think we need to calibrate what those requirements are and use that calibration, use that understanding of, of the level of public services, the level of future investment in transit, in housing, in our community, to then drive the choice and selection of revenue tools. So I much prefer to think of it, frankly, as, as what's the objective? What are we trying to accomplish? How much does that cost? And at what point does that begin, does that cost become unaffordable under our current model? And then use that to build in a sensible conversation around how you fill that, uh, how you fill that gap. Because otherwise, it's way too easily characterized as just a tax grab. And, and it's not meant to be a tax grab. It's meant to add real value into our uh, communities. The other piece, though, I think that, that from a public servant standpoint, and perhaps from a university standpoint, we have to remember is that, that the City of Toronto does not yet have access to and, and uh, those sources of revenue that are truly progressive. And the majority of our revenues are going to come from, um, the majority of our own source revenues are going to come from uh, a, uh, a property tax that in its structure with residential and non-residential, non-residential being bundled into business, has the potential to be regressive. And we want to be a little bit cautious about how we rely on those, those mechanisms. So I think from an equity justice perspective, we have to be a little bit cautious about those. That does drive the conversation about revenue tools. And let's be clear, revenue tools is not a dirty word. Revenue tools are exactly what has saved the city of Toronto and exactly what has allowed the city of Toronto to continue to uh, prosper and make public investments. So just picking up on, on your point a little bit further here, um, and you know, the sort of idea that um, one needs to make a good case for, uh, for new revenue tools uh, in order to, um, to have them see any kind of a chance of success. Again, looking south of the border, we've seen that local governments have sought to raise uh, taxes by holding referenda, where they have focused, uh, you know, a question on new tax increases that are linked to specific spending priorities uh, as a way of building confidence amongst the electorate that indeed, um, you know, the money is being used for a specific purpose. So it's less an act of faith on the part of the voter uh, and more a kind of contract. Uh, a, a kind of social contract, uh, whether that's to deliver you know, uh, better transit, uh, better library service, whatever that might be. 
Uh, could you ever imagine uh, these kinds of ballot initiatives uh, coming to Toronto as a, as a tool to raise revenues, assuming that we have indeed um, had that larger discussion that you referred to a few minutes ago? So I can imagine it, um, for sure. <laughs> um, it, it is not something that, that, frankly, comes naturally to me in this. It, 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 I think that, that there is a legitimacy to government policy. There is a legitimacy to shared public investment and shared pooling of risk and, and public policy outcomes. And there is an efficiency to that. So I think we do owe the taxpayer as public servants, and I'm a public servant, I'm a proud public servant, but we do owe our very best efforts to be as efficient and effective as we possibly can. But I, I think we can actually allocate money with pride. I think, I think when we have that dialogue with council, when council makes a decision about the appropriate level of public services and we have a dialogue with them about the appropriate requirements to fund that, I think we can do that uh, proudly. And I think that the existing institutional mechanisms are sufficiently robust to create and deliver public consent. And, and I observe that, that the public is sensitive, and I think legitimately so, about generalized tax increases without understanding where that money goes. I observe that the Toronto public has been very gracious over a period of time in accepting fees and other services that that are clearly linked to specific outcomes. So I think there are ways in which this needs to be you know, figured out and worked, uh, right. worked through. This can never be money for nothing. It has to be linked to specific uh, outcomes. And we as public servants and, and council needs to be confident that there is value in that. Yep. Can we uh, then move to the borrowing side? You, you made some references to debt uh, in your presentation. You noted that the City of Toronto has a self-imposed debt limit of 15% mm -hmm. of its uh, operating budget uh, or own source revenues. The province, though, has set a ceiling of uh, up to 25% for municipalities. And um, so, you know, I think you said in passing that there was just a little bit room a little bit of room to grow there. There's actually quite a bit of room if we wanted to go that much higher. Um, many people have pointed out this is a good time to be taking on debt given the state of interest rates. Um, also, uh, you know, it makes sense that if you are paying for long-term assets uh, that you uh, do so in a way, you know, which is also appropriately long-term in terms of borrowing. So there's a certain symmetry there. Um, so, you know, uh, is now the time, in fact, for Toronto to be uh, reconsidering it, its debt strategy? Well, if this were council, I'd be referring to Deputy City Manager Roberto Rossini for that. Um, it's not, so, so I have to answer it my, uh, myself. I, I think, so, so it's, it, you phrase it almost as a theoretical question. Um, and, and for me, it's not a theoretical question, it's a practical question. We are, you know, in all likelihood going to come bouncing up pretty hard against that 15% limit, and we're likely going to have to ask council or give some council some advice that they may want to consider that. If you're raised to 25 or you go on bended knee to the province and you even get that changed, how much incremental room does that give you? And remember that that in the city structure, we pay back principal and interest, and it comes back very quickly on the operating, and operating as a share of capital, uh, uh, sorry, uh, interest as a share of capital, then begins to squeeze out fairly quickly. So it is, a, it is an important tool. I think it will likely be one that, that in the fullness of time will have to be deployed. There's probably relatively little choice about that. But it doesn't give you as much space. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, I want to I wanna let out this belt. You know, and, and you're going to have to let out the belt, but ultimately, that, that it's an important and necessary step. You'll feel more comfortable, but it may not be the long-term uh, mechanism. And I also think we want to be a little bit careful about the intergenerational transfer aspects and everything like that, because our assets are long-lived, but the hole we're facing is also one that exists because we didn't set aside money to fund known pressures. And I think we want to think a little bit about whether or not that is a strategy we just want to repeat you know, each time. I'm not sure that we do want to take a dodge on that. So that's a conversation for council. Mm -hmm. But I think that requires some, some thought and some, some uh, thinking. So absolutely, you know, some incremental debt. But incremental debt won't buy you as much as you think it will. 
my guess, and we have to be a little bit cautious about the, the equity and other aspects of, of uh, borrowing. And that even includes borrowing at, at low, uh, low interest rates. Um, I'm a finance nerd, deeply conservative and cautious person. I think those are challengeable assumptions. That is my, my core perspective on, uh, on that. Likely shared by a number of other public servants, but that is why we have counsel. Right. That is why we ask counsel to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see why you got the job, so. <laughs> uh, so let me broaden this out a little bit more. Um, I mean, you've, you've really done a great job this afternoon here of raising some existential questions. I tried to say they weren't existential. Well. I tried to say, I, try, I said that. Anyway, sorry. They're not existential. Okay, so let me, let me come back to you on that. Uh, many of the problems that we have, not all of them, but many of the problems that we have are problems that stem from the success of the city. Yes. Um, and we are Absolutely. indeed fortunate when you look around the world to consider the kind of growth that we have here. So these are, in some sense, nice problems to have. Absolutely. But um, I guess there are two uh, thoughts that, that uh, flow from that. First of all, we can't take that growth for granted in the future. Uh, and <clears throat> some of the services and some of the investments that we're talking about here today are indeed critical to ensure we get right in order to uh, make sure that we don't kill the goose that is laying the golden eggs. But secondly, uh, even if we assume uh, continued growth into the future, and particularly if we assume continued growth into, a fu into the future, we still face some very pressing needs in terms of services and in terms of infrastructure for going to uh, manage growth in an appropriate way. So um, in that sense, I guess I'm describing the current situation as existential. Um, given that, um, how do we sort of start a wider conversation about, um, about what the city needs to do with regard to strategy? How do we um, build that kind of consensus that you referred to earlier? I mean, you, you say that it's council's problem or it's council's responsibility. And in a very basic sense, it's, it's certainly true. But there are other uh, organizations within the city, uh, such as the one in which we sit, the university, uh, that could be playing a part in helping to kind of uh, convene that conversation as well. So I would really welcome your, your broader thoughts on how we um, really coordinate and encourage that sort of conversation in the city. So, so I very much appreciate the, the question. I think it's a great uh, question. You will understand I work for council. <laughs> my, my perspective is very specific and related to, uh, to that. But let me step back and, and just agree vigorously that, that, that Toronto is a marvelous place and it has some, some great problems and some great opportunities and it is a global uh, model and, and we need to not squander that. We need to lever that and, and we really, really cannot squander that. That would be a terrible, terrible outcome that we're collectively not going to let happen. So how do we find the way to manage the glorious development and integration pressures we have? And how do we at the same time manage to mitigate and address some of the income and poverty and stratification issues that we can viscerally feel get crunchy in our society? And you're right, it is a conversation, I'm right, it is a conversation that council has to determine in a fiscal and funding and other perspectives, but it is an enormously important conversation for uh, civil uh, society. And I think that conversation needs to bloom, I think it needs to broaden, I think it needs to be deeply respectful, I think it needs to understand that we can't create money from nowhere. That it's not just a question of, of easy things. We need to have a conversation around the source and the application of funds, around the regulatory context, around how we can do those things. I think the university has an enormously important role in that context as an institution and through the scholarship of its individuals. I think the universities, as a source for talent, are incredibly, uh, are incredibly important. I think the universities, as, as a place for inspiration, as a place for leading that conversation in these dialogues and others, hopefully a relatively safe space to bring out thought experiments and begin to have that dialogue and begin to say, what do we want? And then how do we make that happen, including the fiscal side? I think absolutely vital, and I, I welcome all of us into that, uh, into that uh, conversation. And I think Toronto has a long and honorable conversa uh, history over decades of, of bringing civil society into that vigorous but, but respectful conversation. 
So um, <clears throat> my last question, and then I think we'll, we'll open it up to the audience, is um, just to get you to reflect a little bit. You've only been at the city a short time, but it's been intense from the sounds of things. To reflect a little bit on the difference between uh, <clears throat> the environment you find yourself in at City Hall compared to your, your previous job. Okay. You know those numbers out there with those revenue numbers and those expense numbers? They're the same number. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Joe. You know, they are the same number. So one of the differences is it's starting from a balance. And I say that partly ironically, but partly uh, uh, not. They are very, very institutional, very different institutional uh, structures. And what I will say is that there is beauty and integrity in the relationship between staff and council. There are complications and annoyances and frustrations and puts and takes. But the, the opportunity to work in, in two areas is something that, that I'm very privileged to, uh, to experience. I'm very privileged to have an opportunity to work increasingly at the front line in those services that are granular and have such an immediate impact. And the opportunity, frankly, to be uh, transparent, to provide advice, and to be held accountable in a public forum for that advice. I like in theory. I'm sure in practice I'll like uh, less. But it is at this point, you know, 100 days in, a thing of, of uh, beauty. And I take nothing away from the institutional context of the province, which I similarly believe to be a, a marvelous government that operates in a public interest and has been for me a great, great place to, uh, to work. But, but frankly, I'm, I'm thrilled to be at the city. And I believe that the city, I believe that we understand something that we didn't a relatively small number of, of years ago, which is the, the centrality of, of the urban environment as what drives our life experience, what drives our competitiveness, our innovation, drives our, our social uh, experiments, our, our ability to integrate and uh, work together. And, and we've always had a center periphery model, and, and this is the center. And I feel enormously privileged to be supporting that, that institutional uh, mechanism and, and overjoyed that I have a chance to, to work in what is an exciting and, and uh, dynamic uh, environment. And the only thing I want to do is not blow it. <laughs> and, you know, I want to have that dialogue around how we don't blow it, like how we have this marvelous opportunity, this great place. We're among the best places in the world. We have first world problems. Let's figure out how we continue to be the magnet and continue to be the exciting place we, uh, we are. Thank you. So we have some time now for questions from the audience. It would be helpful if you could use a microphone so that uh, those who are watching via webcast now or in the future can actually hear your question. So come on to two two. All right. <laughs> and on that note, yeah, as it should be. Yeah. Over uh, to you, uh, Bill hey, Robson. Hi. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Having talked a bit about revenue and, and borrowing, I wanted to just uh, go over to services for a moment. Um, I think it was just this morning I was hearing on the radio disputes over whether getting the traffic to flow more freely was working and quarrels about the quality of the data. And I wanted to ask Peter, the City of Toronto collects a lot of data on how well things are working. And we don't seem to see it very often or hear it referred to very often. And I wonder if there's some potential to shift the conversation a little bit in ways that would be helpful, whether it's making the case for more revenue, but also just in, as, as we look at the service delivery, if we were to just make more use of what I think is a fairly comprehensive set of indicators of how well the city's functioning. So, so let's address that and let, let's pick it up from the perspective of there's a tremendous amount of, of information and let's let's be honest and bifurcate the types of information we publish and the types of information we don't. We're pretty good at publishing a lot of kind of quantitative, direct information about things that we're pretty comfortable with, our key performance indicators. We have OMBI, you know, Ontario Municipal Performance Indicators. We have a variety of things like that, long honorable tradition. On the social side, we're a little bit less clear on, on those uh, pieces. I think the reality is, I want to be careful, cautious about that. Um, as we look at public services, we have to realize that information and the availability of information has the potential to be a core, core public service. And we may have to reimagine to some extent how we deliver public services and the availability of information. A recent hackathon at the City of Toronto associated with uh, traffic management, a handful of other things, indicators of that, but probably can go well 
beyond uh, that. It's actually a question that beyond vigorous agreement, Bill, it's hard to get at because it is a question of basically what is the information, how has it been collected, how can it be put forward in a user-friendly, accessible format, and then how do we make use of it or how does the public make use of it once it is, is available? And those are not theoretical questions. The theory is pretty clear. More information, more sharing, better. The public pays for it. We should collect it. We should be accountable for it. We should make it available. But then the question is, how do you actually bring it through the, uh, through the mechanics of, of, of not just the theory, but in the practice? And I think we have made some, some real strides. And in the last little while, I think, uh, John Broadhead, you were involved through uh, Evergreen in creating a mechanism that, that allowed city information, city data to come forward, not just in a broad public availability format, but in a way that actually drives individuals, creative, intelligent individuals and groups to make use of that data in a dynamic, in a dynamic uh, way. And that, I think, has the potential to be uh, transformational and hugely important. So we'll leave the revenue side a piece. Let's just actually talk about the services. There is lots of opportunity to use information to create better, more empowered, more effective uh, public services. And also as an important side benefit to allow for greater accountability because where there's accountability, there's oftentimes different ways of, of doing things, oftentimes improved ways of doing things. Great. But it's easier said than done. If you could uh, introduce yourself before you ask your question. Sure, it's uh, Richard Joy from the Urban Land Institute. Uh, um, I've noticed that, that, that today is a bit of a, a new narrative, your new city manager, but there's a little bit of a, a, a new narrative when it comes to the issue of uh, uh, cost efficiencies and, and, uh, and city expenditures. And, uh, and whereas the previous city manager, I think, was making the case over, over a decade plus that uh, uh, we were pretty close to the bone, it sounds like I'm hearing you think there's still a little bit of flesh. And, uh, and the, the, the question around expenditure reduction or, or, or constraint um, it seems to be an area where you think there's still some, some room, and, and no doubt there is, but uh, with the two largest ones being police, where I think most people would agree there's, there's probably some opportunities for savings, the other though being transit, where transit operating funding has, uh, for many people's minds, not been keeping pace with demands. And that, in fact, if there's one area where we want to see expenditure increases, it's probably transit deliberately to increase costs so that we're delivering more service where we need it desperately in one of North America's most gridlocked cities. So I'm just trying to, trying to square uh, how you might see uh, opportunities for cost constraint where perhaps the argument is now finally uh, very strongly there for perhaps expenditure increases. So um, I, I think that the question is not so a couple of things. I will never shy away from, and I don't think Joe or other uh, municipal leaders will ever shy away from expecting that, that we try our hardest uh, to deliver effective, efficient public services in a public interest. And I think in that world, we have to bargain hard, we have to hold ourselves to account, we have to operate against performance indicators, we have to develop our talent, and we have to manage as rigorously as we, uh, as we possibly can. And I think we owe that to ourselves, uh, to council, and to the people we serve to, to uh, do that to the greatest extent we, uh, uh, we can. I think there is a, a legitimate and technical question about how much capacity there is to generate savings relative to the fiscal gaps we have. And I think that that implicit in my remarks that I'll make a little bit more explicit is that while savings and efficiencies are an important part of any narrative and need to be demonstrated to the tax base and the council, they and of themselves may well fall short of the very material cost drivers I identified on those uh, slides, including the very large unfunded capital needs that are likely uh, required. So I think we have to look at a range of toolkits. And I do not think that we uh, ever say that that expenditure management and efficiency is not part of that toolkit. I think we understand that it is, but I think we then have to look quantitatively, not rhetorically, but quantitatively, about how much of a difference that will make. And likely, it will not offset the need for incremental uh, investment. And then it becomes a policy choice. 
do we want to make the incremental investment and or do we not want to make the incremental investment? And if we do want to make the incremental investment, then there is a dialogue about the way in which that is appropriately funded over time. And there's a wide range of tools from debt to revenue to all of those other things that need to be brought into that, into that equation. So I realize, Richard, that's a technical answer, but it's one that I feel that, that, that um, yes, expenditure constraint is an important part of every uh, element, but it is, um, we have to be very careful about understanding whether or not it is uh, sufficient. At the level of intuition, it alone will not be sufficient in order to fund core city building priorities, and council will have the opportunity to decide the appropriate level of, of investment uh, going forward. And to someone who needs no introduction, please introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Golden, uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate your point of view that we need to discuss, uh, start any discussion around revenue tools with what kind of city do we want. Um, but about, uh, I can't remember how many years ago, we, at, when I was at the conference board, we were hired by uh, David Miller to do a study of the so-called fiscal gap. And uh, we looked at the unfunded capital, we looked at the typical benchmarks of how much we spend per capita compared to other cities. Uh, we looked at the existing services. We looked at the costs, which Enid has since documented, uh, imposed by amalgamation and the, uh, as Enid and I, I just have to get this in, did predict the, <laughs> sorry about that, but we did predict that, no, that the savings would not materialize. Um, and, and we looked at all of that, and we concluded, Peter, that there was, in fact, a structural deficit. Mm -hmm. And the recommendation of our report when I was at the conference board is that we needed access to a growth tax. The second perspective I bring to the discussion is my many 20 years at United Way, where I saw uh, and focused on a large part of the city that wasn't benefiting from the opportunity side of the equation. And I looked at uh, how public housing was kept and our failure to invest in so many of the services from a maintenance and renewal point of view. And so when I put those two perspectives together, uh, even though maybe I don't have the, num I don't have the numbers in, in front of me now, but it does seem to me, anyway, my, my, uh, um, uh, my take on it is that we do have, uh, uh, to be sustainable, we are going to need to look at, at, at uh, some revenue changes and uh, access to a growth tax. My own personal favorite would be um, a small uh, sales tax, where it, it wouldn't be just on those who live here, but on those who benefit as tourists, et cetera, and not large enough to distort buying, but uh, a small sales tax, which would yield some, some increase. So uh, I just wondered if you were even aware of that study. And again, I, I have to say, well, I think it was about, must have been, when was David Mayer, David Miller? Eight so, or seven, seven, eight years. Two, seven, eight so years ago, was it? it's not too long ago, and I oh. and I thought about you know putting in a big slide saying none of this is new, um, because <laughs> none of it is is new. Absolutely, no observation I made through this is not fully precedented. All of it is documented. Um, I think the challenge is is likely that um, we've. We did bring in a new revenue tool. We brought in the user fees and we brought in land transfer tax. Land transfer tax radically overperformed its expectations. That created some momentum that disguised precisely the circumstance and delayed the period of structural adjustment. What I'm putting on the table right now in the form of a thought experiment is, oh yeah, maybe that's played itself out and maybe we need to reintegrate that dialogue. And it starts from exactly the perspective of what city building do you want from the twin perspectives of managing growth, which we're fortunate to have, and then managing the very real social pressures that we can see viscerally and feel viscerally around us. And how do we do that? Now, I'm a new city manager. I'm not going to speak for council in that, uh, uh, that context. So that is a, a conversation that needs to happen with, uh, with council and broader civil society, to your, uh, your point, uh, Merrick. But I think it does take us into a realm of, of, uh, collective, uh, of collective investment. And then I think, though, the one thing that I would have, because I do come from an environment, I am privileged to have been the Ontario Deputy Minister of, of Finance, I do think that the questions of the allocation of tax effort are very technical. And we need to understand the potentially distorting, the potential gamesmanship, the potential risks associated, the, the permission issues, the role of federal provincial, the role of CRA in these things. These are not simple uh, questions that cannot be simply addressed. So I think we do need to start off from the need 
and then we need to how to fill that need, and that does need to be a rich, detailed uh, economics and, and uh, uh, reality-based uh, conversation that I, for one, would welcome and not, not shy away from. Over to you. Hi, my name is Saad Ahmed, and I'm with Tiny Toronto. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask uh, or make a connection between a few of the themes that you brought up on um, equity, housing, inner city, and user fees. Um, my question is that, uh, is there a possibility that Toronto would explore tiny dwellings as Vancouver does for laneway housing? And Sydney's done so over the last year with granny flats, and they've made more than 8,000 of them over the last year. And um, if it has uh, any possibility of universal consultation as it's being done in Ottawa for the last month on coach houses. So I'm going to respectfully dodge the question, the specifics of the question, and I'm going to speak to something slightly more broadly, which is that oftentimes as public servants, and I'll speak personally as a public servant in this context, we have massive regulatory infrastructure, and we do not understand the innovation constraining aspects of that public sector infrastructure in that context. And whether it is the use of data, how we define what's a safe mode of transportation, how we define all sorts of other things, I think from a public service perspective, including what we define to be an acceptable dwelling or other things, we need to look at why we have regulations and whether or not those regulations are really in a public interest or a public safety, or whether or not they represent somebody's historic idea of what represented a community or represented an historic economic interest that we vigorously continue to defend long after it served its economic purpose. So I think that the vigorous questioning of our regulatory approach and our assumptions, our understanding, is incredibly, incredibly helpful. And whether or not it's on the specifics that you talk about, that it's something I'm not familiar enough to, to make a meaningful comment on, but I think we do need to understand where it is that we and, and the, the public sector constrains innovation, and I think we constrain innovation in many, many ways through regulatory mechanisms that have probably outlived their, uh, their usefulness. I won't mention any examples, but a few come to mind. <laughs> Thank and you on much. that, over to you, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, Izzy Lyon, uh, I used to work in the uh, province. Uh, I agree with you totally that we need to have this basic discussion, but that discussion is taking place within a major discussion that's been going on for decades, starting with Thatcher, Reagan, and I'd say uh, Harper, that says government is bad, uh, politicians are, ru are running on the platform of smaller government, uh, you know, more personal, uh, you know, initiative, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you start that discussion when the vast majority of people uh, are, are willing to, to have less services for, you know, lower taxes? So, so I appreciate the question, Izzy, and I, and I actually, but I'm going to respectfully disagree with it. Um, and and I, I do believe that, that the public in general appreciates uh, public services, and if you don't believe that, just try and cut them. They, they, they do feel very, very comfortable with, uh, with the degree of, of public services. And I certainly think I, I spoke earlier about my, my pride and, and uh, the, the joy I take in, in collective uh, investment. Um, there is a reality though, and the reality is that for a great number of people in our society, economic growth, which has been fairly impressive over a period of time, has not risen their boats up that much, and they pay and they feel those taxes as directly coming off uh, their income. There is another reality that globalization allows the wealthy and the corporate players to shift their resources around, and there becomes a pretty quick limit about the level of taxation you can impose without bringing, without, in, without creating very effective counter uh, measures and ending up yourself. So, so there is kind of a reality of a Laffer curve. I don't want to say that, but there is a reality of a Laffer curve that comes in surprisingly early on a bunch of, of things. And it's not the way Arthur Laffer described it, but there is kind of, you have to be careful about that. And there is a reality behind the need to be very, very careful with tax-based uh, money in those contexts. I think as long as you meet those thresholds, you actually will have permission from the public to invest in public services. 
But I think we need to not think of that as an ideological or a Reagan-Thatcher perspective, but a perspective that springs organically and is real. Concern about taxpayer money is a real concern. I think we need to be very respectful of that and in turn make the case of why public sector investment is very efficient. We as Canadians are enormously proud of the efficiency, the global capacity we have relative to our American neighbors of our healthcare system. I think we need to bring that same sense of, of, of pride into our more general civic, uh, our more general and civic investments. And in the city of Toronto, you get a lot of public services that in the US you have to pay for. They're way cheaper if we pool them. That's a good outcome. I think we need to be clear and proud and articulate that. And I do believe that, that we will have public permission to make those investments and demonstrate that results. But I also want to be clear, that's not something that's decided by public servants. You know, I'm acutely aware that while I've been a privileged and senior public servant, I am a public servant. I advise and implement, but those are policy decisions that are made by elected officials. And I am deeply respectful of the role of civil society in influencing the broader policy climate and the role of elected officials in actually making those decisions. Appreciate the question. Great question. And if I may say, it suggests a role for a broader civil society in helping to you know, convene these bigger discussions about the size and nature and extent and power of the public realm. Last question goes to you, sir, and you are? Uh, Henrik Bushman, lucky me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently a member of a group called Civic Tech, which is, I guess, part of the civil society. I'm the leader of a group that's uh, working on innovative ways of looking at the uh, city budget. Um, I'm a software developer, but in the 2000s, I was a webmaster for a number of uh, neighborhood groups around Dufferin Grove Park in particular. So mm -hmm. over about 10 years, I've had the opportunity to observe the interaction of kind of community-based community, community -based innovation and uh, uh, civil servants and council. Um, my overall impression, um, having thought about this, you know, pretty deeply, is that there's a there's a um, deeply compliance-oriented culture in uh, the civil service in Toronto. I'm sure it's not unique to to Toronto, also the province that you come from, um, and that there's a huge opportunity cost there. You know, in the sense that it's uh, compliant as uh, as distinct from innovative, or at least the, the emphasis is on compliance over innovation, the emphasis is on system as opposed to people. And I think there's a huge cost to that. We just saw an example of a, an idea for innovation. So I wanted to challenge you on this notion, I think you called it a center of peripheral system. It's an interesting uh, term, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up, but I wanted to challenge you on that notion because I think there's room for um, sort of decentralizing um, the ability to innovate and react to community needs among the 55,000 people, uh, which is a huge asset in terms of, you know, human, human abilities, human insights, and so forth, to work directly with communities, to come up with innovative ideas, to make the budgets uh, far more efficient than they are. I've got a lot of experience in Dufferin Park. I don't want to go on, but there, there's actually some substance back to this. So it's a challenge to your notion that it's only through council. I think there's room for trying to change the culture, uh, including through policy, to, to allow for frontline staff to have more authority and wake up thinking, how can I add value to the city as opposed to how, 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 what do I have to do to be compliant? You know, it's a different sort of attitude. And I think an enormous, my impression of parks and rec was that there's a potential for savings there of 20 to 30 percent, for example, not to mention improvements. Thank so you. So I think that is, that is a great uh, question. And, and let me just define the center peripheral uh, piece. That was a reference that, that I probably should have done without. Um, th those who were at U of T from 1976 to 1981 in the political economy department mm -hmm. <laughs> will understand uh, the reference it has to do with the nature of, of um, uh, Harold Adams Innes and, and the staple economy and how that actually works, which still I think does have some explanatory value in terms of some other things. It wasn't actually related to city governance and, and because of its complexity and obscurity, I, it was an academic setting, so I thought I'd throw it in. I probably should have left it out. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are a we got the reference. A uh, handful of people who would understand that, and they are even nerdier than my slides. Um, but the, the, the thing, it's actually not a challengeable notion. You're, you're, you're going to be right. The city of Toronto 
is as are large hierarchical organizations focused in on compliance. That is how we do our work. And, and from an institutional and organizational standpoint, we are challenged. We are genuinely challenged and genuinely need to have the dialogue around within the reality of, you know, gotcha politics, within the reality of the need for consistency across geography, within the reality of a whole bunch of other things, how do we create the environment that makes information available, empowers staff, allows creativity. That is a genuine problem that many, many large organizations, including but not limited to government, are struggling with. We struggle with that every day. I hope we make a difference. We try hard to make a difference, but it is something that we will always, it will always be a work in progress. And this is an area where feedback is always welcome. And the reality is that what we want as public servants is a civil society that gives us the permission and the capacity to do our jobs as well as we possibly can. And doing those jobs bring, means bringing judgment into the equation. That's not an easy thing to do. We try very, very hard to bring that. Uh, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we, uh, we fail. I want to wrap up though with one specific thing, which is this is a university. Many of you will have access to students. Many of your students will be exceptionally bright. The ones who are exceptionally bright, send them to the city of Toronto to work. <laughs> I used to have a different message. That message was wrong. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. The opportunity, in case we are not clear, is the city of Toronto is where it's at. Send the really bright ones to us. Okay, and and we please? do. <laughs> Absolutely. We do send a lot of bright ones to you. Well, I, I would really like to, to thank uh, Peter and Merrick for a really informative session this afternoon on the challenges and opportunities facing Toronto now and the future. Merrick, thanks for not shying away from the tough existential questions. Um, and, and Peter, thanks for a really thoughtful and I would say careful discussion of what's happening in Toronto. Um, but you've really told us, I mean, you started by saying what the city does matters. And that is so true. And, and you also talked about the role of the civil society and, and the importance of the university, if only to send you students, uh, but other ways, other ways as well. I, um, I know you've been there for 100 days. Um, it seems to me like you've gotten it. Uh, you were afraid you might blow it. I think the chances of that happening are very small. Um, we're really delighted to have you here today. Um, I guess I'm a fiscal nerd, um, but you know, if you're a fiscal nerd too, that's okay. <laughs> so uh, just a, a couple of other things. Today's event has been webcast, uh, so please share it with your colleagues who uh, maybe went to the Jays game instead of coming here today. What is the score? Uh, and, but there's still a couple of innings you can catch when you leave. Um, but I'd also like to thank the audience for the great questions that you asked and just thanks for being here.